and welcome to another episode of our crossover event of Lizzie Watches Yaoi and Beneath Your Skin, in which we are discussing the wonderful anime Vatican Miracle Examiners. Because, well, what's more amazing than an anime about beautiful priests that fight demons, demonic possessions, strange rituals, examining miracles, but are also really in love with each other and look at each other with adoration and small touches and yeah be beautiful hi Agaya, how are you today i'm fine thank you my dear and so ready to talk about this new episode ah i'm looking forward to it this episode oh they're trying to remember all the names of all the characters and how they related to each other this episode i started writing it all down and then i was like oh my goodness so yeah we'll get on to that when the time comes but my goodness there was a lot of like and that person was with that person but then that person and then that person and that and i was like oh my goodness that's like eight characters you've introduced in the space of one conversation but yes, but before we get that, our episode starts off with Roberto and Joseph uh, in a car. They've just been interrogated by the police and they're a little bit like, oh, I'm not sure I like being interrogated by the police. It's just, this is a bit weird. They've asked some strange questions. Things seem a bit uncomfortable for our boys. It's all dark and they just don't, they don't seem to have liked what's going on very much. And uh, this is the first time they uh, took a leap of faith, literally. Because uh, um, while the police could have uh, questioned every other priest from the, the church, they had no authority over Joseph and Roberto. Because being a missionary from the Vatican means they are covered by their diplomatic immunity. So there was no way they could have been questioned. I'm not sure about the FBI, but yeah. I'm pretty sure uh, not even the, the FBI in America has the authority to question people with that kind of immunity. I'll go with it's probably Roberto and Joseph as a, like, a sign of good faith agreeing to the questions because they want to be seen as cooperating so that they can continue the investigation without the police trying to stop it every two seconds. But Joseph's looking a little bit like downtrodden and sad. So Roberto puts his arm around him and I'm like, oh, beautiful contact. Look at them go. They're walking in arms around him as they walk off. And then miraculously, the statue of Jesus starts changing colours again. But there's no horns. It's not rainbows. It's not gold. It's changing colours yet again. And Joseph is like, oh my goodness, I must investigate all of this. I must investigate this new colours. I also must investigate this blood sample I seem to have stolen from a crime scene. And Roberto is like, <laughs> or you could go to bed. Maybe get some rest. Maybe do this fresh tomorrow rather than in the middle of the night because you're clearly tired. A bit overexcited by everything that's going on. And yeah, he really does need to rest or he'll burn himself out. So we get our beautiful opening, which I love. Mysterium. It's gorgeous. And our new episode is called The Ghosts of Past Appeared. And this is a reference to the fact that a lot of what we saw at the beginning of the first episode was actually events that happened in the past. And a, something in these characters like past is clearly coming back to like haunt them now. So we get a little recap of what's been going down. You know, we've got this wonderful statue of Jesus that likes to produce rainbows, but everyone's seeing it diff differently. But we've also got this unknown murdered boy that has very poor pigmentation and we don't know quite where he's come from but the episode starts with some children singing a creepy song about Haros 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 watch out he's gonna burn your house down and you're just like well that's truly creepy and Roberto is woken up by the sound of creepy children he's like what is going on and then he hears their mother yelling at them going don't sing that song you are clearly going to summon a demon and then it's going to get you and I'm like this is good motherly advice if you sing a song about demons and summoning demons, there's a good chance that said demon will turn up and you're kind of asking for it. So maybe stop singing the creepy song. Puraros is not a demon. I have to admit, I had to do my research because uh, they say Haros is the Greek god of death. And I thought that was no. Thanos. That was Thanos, exactly. And uh, I think it's because of, the, once again, a problem with the translation from Japanese to the English subtitles, because actually Haros is the 
modern name for Caron. Ah. Caron is uh, the ferryman of uh, Hades, uh, the, the god of afterlife. And he is tasked to bring the newly dead souls from the, from the earth to the afterlife, making them cross the two um, rivers that are in, uh, in the Averno, the Sphinx and the Acheron that uh, are basically they split the afterlife world uh, from the place where normal people go after death and the places that instead uh, belongs to the heroes. They have another place in the afterlife. They are not with the common people. So uh, Haros is in truth Karon, okay. and uh, he said that uh, people had to pay to be to be brought across the rivers. That's why in the past uh, a coin was put in the mouth of the corpse before burial, so that uh, Caron could be paid. People who were left unburied or who couldn't afford the coin for the ferryman, they were said they had to spend 100 years wandering on the shores before they could pass. Okay, so that makes more sense, because obviously I know Caron as the ferryman. Again, my knowledge of Greek mythology coming from Percy Jackson. But, you know, the mythology's right in Percy Jackson, so that's where I've got my education from, you know. And, yeah, so it makes sense. If you're singing a song about something collecting you, the ferryman would be coming for your soul. And they also sing about this house over there, which turns out is kind of a local slang word for hell. And so Heros is taking people to the gates of hell. It's basically what and this folk song is interpreted as. They're obviously something a little bit lost in translation, but the actual meaning behind the song and what they were trying to convey is more accurate. So Roberto, after his little morning work, walk, finding out about this bit of folklore, he goes to find Joseph, who's pulled an all-nighter. He's been up all night, investigating, doing experiments, just not sleeping like he was supposed to. And Roberto was like, please just go to bed. Just have a sleep, just rest before you burn yourself out and you become ill. And I'm like, oh, he's looking after his boyfriend. It's cute. And Joseph is like, oh, what are you going to do? It's like, I'm going to go for a walk. I mean, I was half expecting, like, Joseph to go, watch out for snakes. <laughs> but, you know, luckily, I think he's gotten over his obsession with snakes. So Roberto goes for a nice walk around town. And it seems very nice in town. And he's like, he wants to know a little bit more about, like, the song the children were singing, but also the mother's reaction to the song. And so he goes to investigate the people. He goes to visit the mother of the children and find out more. And here's where we get a lot of information about a lot of characters that I'm going to try and piece together in a meaningful way. So the first major thing we find out is that found footage documentary from the beginning was 30 years ago. So it was 30 years ago. And then the only person that actually died that night was Carlos, who was the cameraman, who was the one that got decapitated by the motley crown, motley crown, the motley clown. Then we find out that before he became Father Tronus, Antonio was just a regular guy and he was the other guy that was in that trip. Then there were two women. There was... Antonio's girlfriend Dominica and Carlos's fiance Teresa and now Teresa went missing and they don't know what happened to her and then we saw that Dominica was the one that witnessed Carlos head being cut off and she runs off in a fit of like oh my goodness with Antonio like trying to find her but after that event a lot of the parents and the older generation were kind of happy that Carlos had been murdered because it turns out he wasn't the nicest of guys he's like he thought that his status as a rugby player and a you know a bit of a jack the lad and like town hero meant he could get away with things and he clearly had a bit of an abusive relationship towards Teresa so Teresa's dad was particularly pleased that she broke free of him and that he passed on what he didn't appreciate is after Carlos passed down, 
Carlos's friend, Rodriguez, started following Teresa around town, pestering her. And this was upsetting Teresa. Of course, it would upset being followed around by who's known as a bit of a lo local thug as well and not the kind of guy you wanted to get involved with. Meanwhile, Antonio, who was dating Dominica, couldn't like cope with the change in his girlfriend because after what she witnessed she started having mental health issues going more mad and she kind of just like loses it and becomes a bit of a shut-in and not able to deal with what she saw that night so they break up and through like force of like the only people that kind of like alive or sane then Teresa and Antonio get engaged and so they are now engaged to get married, which for Teresa means that, like, at least she's got some safety from Rodriguez, who is following her around. And then she's got some security. And it means that Antonio could also kind of move on from his relationship with Dominica. Unfortunately, the night before the wedding, Teresa is hit by lightning and killed. And it's like, oh, my goodness, that's harsh. You escape being decapitated in the woods where your fiance is killed, you, you know, the local thug is finally like, you know, backing off and you get struck by lightning the day before your wedding. That's got to be pretty, pretty awful and pretty upsetting for Antonio. So Antonio, after that event, decides to give all his wealth away and become a priest and sets out his new life as Father Thrones. Also, we find out that Rodriguez is now living with his new girlfriend. Her name is, oh my goodness. Fioletta. That's it, I've got it here. I was trying to read it and I've written Rioletta. I realise I haven't crossed my F. Because technically the real name is Violetta. I oh. don't know why the, the translation say the Fioletta, but the real name is Violetta. Oh, okay. So my random spelling mistake was actually correct. So, Rodriguez is now living with his girlfriend, Violetta. Thronus is now a priest. Teresa is now dead. But it turns out that before she was hit by lightning, her father believes that she was having premonitions about this death. Because just before the wedding and on the build-up to the wedding, she was getting more and more paranoid that she was being followed or watched and talking about some kind of demon that was trying to get her. And let's just be honest. To be striken by uh, lightning is very very rare oh. it's not so common so there is something behind Teresa's death I'm pretty sure of that yeah definitely more to this conspiracy but yes it's all quite like like interrelated and you didn't quite realize how related all these players were and there's this past history and Luckily, they are able to get a, a videotape. Roberto manages to get a copy of the video we saw from the first episode that, so that he and Joseph can review it themselves. So they go to review the video. Meanwhile, we get a shed with some very angry cows in it. And I was just like, what is that noise? Wow, those are they demonically possessed cows? Are they angry? But no, the cows are really angry because the frozen body of Father Thronus seems to have turned up in their shed late at night. And the poor farmer is just like, what is going on? And we're like, how did Father Thronus freeze to death and end up in a cow shed in a completely different city that I couldn't pronounce the name of? So over to you. Real place? Viareggio. Yeah, yeah. it is. So or Livorno. I'm not sure which one of that. Because they went to, to the police in Viareggio and then uh, the shed is in Livorno. Yeah. yeah, but both of them are... Nor are uh, real existing yeah. places. So we're slowly through geography locating where there's Monty <laughs> is. We'll like we'll be able to draw a map going right. Hmm. I'm starting to to think it could be Monterigioni, but I'm not sure. <laughs> mm, probably I'm talking uh, like someone who played or watched people play uh, Assassin's Creed too many times because Monterigioni is where. Renzo Auditore da Firenze has his at Carter's before uh, Cesare Borgia destroys it. So, ah. although it's still, if it's like you know, a Borgia destroys it, that's still related because we do have a Borgia on the loose. 
So that's true. I didn't think about that. Yeah, it could really be Monteriggioni. There we go. I mean, I'm going to believe that more as the actual Italian in this conversation. You would know more <laughs> about where these places are in your home country. Like, you know, <laughs> if this was happening somewhere between Bath and like Bristol or like where I am, then I'd be like, ah, it's clearly happening in Bradford upon Avon. But alas, no. <laughs> anyway, moving on from my, my geography. Um, so, yes, our beautiful priests are looking through this, like, video and they're noting that the sound of the horn is the same sound that they're hearing before the miracles are happening in the church and that the clown is, that's decapitating, is the decapitating clown that looks a lot like the motley clown that is also the symbol that's outside the church. And they're like, okay, this is weird. This event that happened 30 years ago seems very related to what's going on now. Do you know what also is very, very shocking in the videotape they are watching that the person holding the camera and being decapitated is still able to film his own head rolling away yes and that's a little bit impossible yep yeah they yes they pick up going it's strange how did he film his head rolling away it's like yeah once you're decapitated you drop the camera you wouldn't keep it and film a rolling around head and they obviously like the shot of Dominica, like they're like, oh, she is looking terrified. She's clearly not holding the camera. She is escaping for her life there. Even because when you hold the camera, you are behind the camera. So you to to literally watch your head rolling away after it was taken from your body, it's impossible. It's simply impossible. So what the hell happened with that camera? Who was really holding the camera? Yeah. And what Domenica said is still uh, said, so it's still a mystery. Yes. Well, we come back, and obviously it's the morning, and Rainbow Jesus is sparkling in full beauty, and Joseph goes to Roberto, and then starts noting that like, oh, his heart rate's a bit like elevated, and it's like, oh, are you just doing like spontaneous checks on Roberto to make sure he's not being bitten by any more snakes? And he's like, oh, you need to rest a bit. Oh, I hope you're not getting ill. But it turns out that he's given these like checks to all the priests to see how their heart rate and their temperatures are in relationship to the miracle going on. It's all part of his like science time. And then we get the arrival of Bill, FBI Bill. And uh, with, um, I was going to call him Bougie. His name is not Bougie. Yes, it is Bougie. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It yeah. is Bougie. Bougie. And Bougie's with him. And Bougie's a bit like, don't tell them everything. And Bill is like, shush, Bougie. I'm friends with these guys. They helped me solve this other case. Of course, I'm going to tell them bits of information. And then we get, ooh, we get our link. Because Bill thinks that this case is somehow connected to Amy. And they're like, how could it possibly be connected to Amy? And we get a lot more, like, weird confusion. For a start, like... Our priest did not know that Tronas was dead. So Bill fills them in that his body was found in a cow shed at approximately minus 30. And clearly what's happened is he was got, taken up the Matterhorn and thrown off the top. And Joseph is like, but that's physically impossible. And Roberto's like, he's joking with you. Don't, don't take things quite so literally. He's trying to explain to you about how ridiculous the whole like situation is and how it's just really impossible to know what went on to get like... Portrone is frozen and in a cow shed. There is a possible explanation, even if it sounds even more illogical than uh, than what we just heard, that the body fell from a plane. Yes, that's what I was thinking, because it's like they've they've kidnapped him, flown him up the atmosphere and thrown him out the plane. That's that would be my logical conclusion. But even because we we watched too much TV and we saw this happening at least a couple of times in a different TV yeah. series. Yeah. So I'm like, hey, I, this is one mystery I might know. But Bill describes why the cases might be related. And basically, the boy that died was clutching a counterfeit bill in his hand. That makes it sound like a counterfeit version of Bill. A counterfeit note of money. And it turns out that back in America, because Joseph is like, how does a crime in Italy relate to like something the FBI is investigating in America? And it's like, well, basically in America recently, there's been this massive counterfeit ring. And the, the notes are now so good that it was like, oh, my goodness, we barely could tell that that was counterfeit money. But because of this counterfeit, there's a lot of laundering it going around, especially in major cities 
around America. But what it's doing is it's devaluing the strength of the dollar and it's also allowing there to be more funding into terrorist groups and secret organizations that are taking advantage of this new state of being and it's throwing them a little bit into like chaos. And then Roberto mentions the fact that, oh, you're talking about secret services, like distributing this somehow. Well, Joseph was just like researching this weird code and this weird clown like symbol that are clearly like working underneath the scenes, like communicating with each other to could possibly be related to this like form of terrorism. How is this related to the boy in the church who obviously found this counterfeit note? Well, we also find out that this poor boy has a, a pigmentation problems but his like hemoglobin is down his like nutrition is down his vitamin d is seriously like it's like he's been living in a place that doesn't see any sunlight and you're like oh could it be another secret underground lair like we know we know that this happens quite often in this series that there are secret underground lairs and yeah so this poor boy just looks like He's not really ever been out in the sun and all the things, the malnutrition, the pigmentation, the vitamin D like deficiency, all points to him not being exposed to sunlight. And yet he appeared magically in this church. But then they notice that he doesn't come from the outside of the church. He seems to appear from an aisle randomly in the church. And he just appears in the church running with this counterfeit note. And then the clown turns up and decapitates him. This is where Tronus catches him in the act and he's like, what are you doing here? And the clown just runs away. And you're like, why did the clown not kill Tronus? What's going on there? What's, what's, what's the connection? But obviously we are still waiting to find out. So of course, in the true mystery of the Vatican, they go to investigate a miracle and they find out that there is a global conspiracy, a possible underground civilization, like... And like, it's all just kind of like piling on top of each other. Something weirder than Rainbow Jesus is happening. And then the last final detail is they've lifted fingerprints off this boy. And they're like, da 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 da, these fingerprints match one person, one Julia. And it's like, oh, dun dun dun, he's still alive. And he's potentially a decapitating clown at the moment. Why the hell? He went from being dressed like a priest to being dressed like a clown is beyond me. I mean, he's such a beautiful man. Just let him be. Yeah. Let him dress like a poshy civilian nobleman he is. No. Yes. Unfortunately, we see him dressed as the clown from the opening credits with his scythe and his mask and clearly gleefully slaughtering children. But we still have the question of why did he kill the clown? What is he there for? How is he involved with this counterfeiting ring? There is definitely a bigger global conspiracy and Julia is happily at the centre of it. Unfortunately, they have no way of knowing where he is or how to find him. Luckily, Roberto, though, has at least, like, you know, started thinking of, like, ways to solve the mystery of what is going on. And Joseph has been doing his little tests, noticing that the temperature of the room. And the fact of the matter is the statue has been painted in this special paint that reacts to like you know the mood I'm, it's, it's like that mood changing you know the mood when you press it and depending on your mood it changes when actually it's not really your mood it's just how hot you you are when you touch it depends but that's what's happened they don't know where the horn sound is coming from but they know that the jesus statue has been covered in a special paint that reacts to changes of temperature and that is why it's shining in all various different magical ways but this arises the bigger question because they found this reason by investigating Tronus and it was Tronus that was hiding the paint and he has been staging a miracle. But we know that Tronus doesn't want the miracle proven because he doesn't want people turning up because he wants to keep it quiet and he doesn't want to affect the congregation and basically is hiding something. So by faking a miracle that he doesn't want proven it's also brought a lot of attention, which he's trying to avoid. But obviously this fake miracle is must be trying to cover up or hide something even worse that he doesn't want people. He'd rather there be a fake miracle than whatever he is actually hiding. 
And also, like, we know that the standard of living isn't great because he's mal- malnourished, but also the autopsy revealed that there's, like, insect debris inside his, like, stomach. So he's been living off worms and centipedes. So he's not getting fed in this disgusting place underground. It doesn't sound very nice. But the only thing now left to do in this investigation is for them all to head to the woods, the woods they're not supposed to go to, and try and look for the gates to hell and this house that's over there. And they find there is a well and they go off to try and find what is going to happen next. Dum, dum, dum. What can possibly go wrong, right? Yeah. Julia is dressed as a killer clown running around decapitating people. There's some malnourished child slaves somewhere underground. There's like a bigger problem than a miracle being happened. Trona's mysterious death. And they're off to go through the gates of hell and look for hell itself, as they've described it. Nothing can go wrong. No. But you know what? Joseph is also worried about how hungry he is. So we get our little on the sofa scene and Joseph is hungry and he misses Roberto's food and Roberto like, promises that he'll cook for him. He goes, oh, I just want to eat your cooking so much. And Roberto says, look, how about after this case, we'll go home and I will cook you a feast. And Joseph is like, yay. And I'm like, oh, Joseph, your priorities right now. You just want Roberto's home cooking. You just want some nice domestic bliss with your husband, the cook. But yes, anything else to add to today's episode, Miss Gaia? No, just that I want the next episode already in my draw. <laughs> it's like, it's got to that stage where it's like a conspiracy within a conspiracy with 10,000 characters and a 30-year mystery and people dead and crowns. And, and there was a lot of information in this episode. And then by the end of it, you realise that the only thing they've worked out was that there was paint on Jesus. But everything yes. else is like global conspiracies and murder and underground bowl children or whatever. You're like, oh, God, we learn absolutely nothing apart from there is colour change paint on Jesus. Oh, well, we'll have to wait for next time. I'll be sending you the next episode soon. But for now, like I say, if you enjoy movies about demonic possession, check out me and Guy's other podcast, Beneath Your Skin. If you like anime and want to see more anime reviews, check out my podcast with my other colleague, Newbie vs. Weeaboo. And for social media, let Zoe spoil you. That way you'll find my Twitter, my Instagram, my Facebook and my YouTube. Lots of exciting videos to watch, art, books, or just to come and say hello. But for now, bye-bye. Gaia? Thank you for listening and bye-bye.